Heartbreak. Um, my name is Carrie Jones. I am an administrative technical director at North Carolina East Soccer, um, and part of my responsibility there, um, I am the co-chair of our newly founded DE&I committee um, with Wendy Burns. Um, and Fearless and Capable, um, we are so excited to be their new organization partner. Um, I had met Candice uh, I had actually heard her speak um, sometime last year and then had the pleasure to meet her in person um, in January. And I myself am a member of Fearless and Capable's community. And I am so excited that NCUSA and Kathy um, saw the value in what Candace is bringing um, to the two females in sport. Um, and and you'll, you'll hear her passion for soccer um, come through her through her, her conversation today. So if we if you have any questions for Candace, um, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will monitor that. But if not, Candace, I'm gonna turn it to you. Awesome, thank you and I appreciate it. And I'll definitely give some time at the end that you guys can ask questions. Uh, so you'll have the chat and both um, unmuting features at the end. So appreciate the time and it's been a pleasure to get to know uh, the staff at North Carolina Youth Soccer, Kathy and Carrie particularly. And the, you know, this topic is always something that people are a little, either a little excited about or a little uncertain on terms of where is this going to go and lead towards. Um, so I want to assure you that this conversation is always done out of uh, respect, out of uh, just empowerment of what certain people's lived stories and lived experiences are um, so that we can honestly create a better soccer community for everyone, not just women and young girls. Um, but certainly that is a target in a lot of the work because, you know, as you look at this picture, uh, I always show, show this picture. This is me when I'm about 12 years old. I'm the one on the far left with a very tight ponytail that I think my dad might have put in that day. Um, but this is me about 12 years old with my soccer coach. And I had had her for about three years up to this point. And she's holding her first child in our, you know, our annual team photo that we always would get. And I think that's important because as a then, you know, young player with no real thoughts on what I'm going to be when I grow up, including a coach. Um, I, I saw it. I didn't ever have to question it when those thoughts started to come in of maybe I want to coach. Maybe that's something I want to do someday. So uh, we think about how we're going to make the game better, you know, and this program, Fearless and Capable, to start off really tries to bring in everyone's different identities and roles that they play in life. And the program is specifically set for women working in sports. But when I say specifically, that means a whole lot of different roles between coaching, refereeing, administration, front off, support staff, whatever it may be. Um, this program has really set up to be able to be, be inclusive to the different identities and roles that we all hold, but that obviously surrounds sport. And so for me, um, a lot of different pieces and parts come into who I am and, and bring to you today. Um, and certainly some of that comes in being a mother, um, a coaching instructor, a coach, a aunt, a sister, um, a mentor in a lot of ways. I coach men's and women's teams. I coach a semi-pro team. I coach a women's college team. Um, and obviously, you know, those, those are parts and pieces people see often because it's either social media or me on the sideline, but there's other things they do like public speaking that, you know, Carrie had the opportunity to see. Um, and some of the things that are identities other people don't often see, but sometimes find out is that I am an advocate. Um, I'm also a sexual assault survivor. So I typically talk about those experiences. Um, and my sexual assault actually came within the game and from a coach that I had. And so, you know, these things and pieces and parts all play into the person I present every day and present to the people I work alongside. So my question to you is, how well do you know the people that are working with you? What other identities and roles maybe do they have that we sometimes get lost in the shuffle when we're looking at their contributions or our desired wants and needs for them um, in terms of how that aligns with their own wants and needs and the things that they have going on in their life. So a little bit about me, but thinking a little bit more about you, I want you to think about oops, going too far ahead. Um, Three questions, and I'm getting too far. Come on, clicker, work with me. Three questions about you I want you to think about. Who helped you out when you began? 
All right. So think kind of right way back, whether you're a coach or a free administrator, whoever, when it all started, who helped you out? Who maybe gave you that first nudge or who um, presented the first job to you? Who was that? Who was there for you when you had doubt or were struggling? I don't know if I can do that. Or, I don't know if I'm ready. Or they just asked me to do this. What do you think? Am I capable of it? Those types of questions, who was there? Maybe it's the same person that helped you out when you began, who was there for you when you had doubt. And then who was there to give you guidance and feedback as you started to really get going in this? Um, who was there uh, when you were maybe getting a performance review or maybe no performance review? Uh, maybe who was there on the sideline watching you could give you feedback if you're a coach or referee? Uh, who were in meetings that were giving you that information of maybe how you did well presenting something, a new idea, a new project? Maybe this is one person for you that, that answers all three of those questions. Maybe it's three different people, and maybe you have no idea. You can't think of anybody for one of these questions or all three. But oftentimes for women working in sports, these questions are answered by a male that was there to help us out when we began, gave us, um, gave us confidence in those doubt moments, and gave us guidance and feedback. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm here today because I had amazing male mentors that helped me out through the assault, um, or the assault experience and trying to kind of reconcile with that. I have amazing male mentors that are the reason I am coaching at the level I am today. But there was always this kind of relatability component that was missing. And so for a lot of women, when they're answering these questions, they can typically identify some good people. I hate when they can't, that bothers me. But when they can, they typically are finding someone that is of the male gender. Not bad, not good, just simply what it is. But I think that relatability piece is something as women that we need to find more because it helps us to come into the profession maybe with seeing that if I can see her, I can be her. But then it also comes into those moments when we maybe have struggle and doubt that relate to being a woman. When we need guidance and feedback as it relates to being a woman in a boardroom of all men and how certain tools and, and ways and techniques seem to work for them and not for us. And so really at the end of the day, I've tried to create Fearless and Capable to put together female mentors that are working in the sports industry that are really, really dedicated to having consistent and impactful mentorship to help these individual women promote themselves personally and professionally in the careers that they desire. And so I am not a one woman show in this. Fearless and Capable brings together lots and lots of women from across the country um, to help this mission come to life. And so I'll, I'll give you a little insight to who those women are here in a little bit, um, but really think of those bold word, words of consistent and impactful. We are not a program that has an open and a closed date for applications. We are here today, tonight, tomorrow, when we have people that are maybe doubting themselves, maybe struggling, maybe looking for guidance and feedback, whether that's in the job they are now or maybe the job they're looking at going into. And so we're here today and we do it in a few different ways so that we can be really relatable and really available to them. But why would that be important that it's consistent? Why would it be important that it's relatable? Why is it important that it's reliable? Well, if we take a look at what women traditionally do and, and have and are, we're not typically the gender that puts ourselves first in our mind. We're not typically a gender that stands strong for ideals. We are, we are fully capable of it, but there's moments that we're not, or there's moments we're wondering why we aren't going for certain things, or there's moments we wonder why we just allow everybody else to kind of get taken care of and then we are sitting in the back. And that's because a lot of times for a lot of women, and it's not every woman, that's why I'm going to end this by telling you to go talk to the women working in your organization, club, group, whatever it might be, team, go talk to them about their lived experiences, understand who's working around you, how you can attract and retain more women to your group. But as general terms, healthy self-interest for women is not something that's been promoted as young girls as young adults, and particularly working in professional environments. And so this healthy self-interest is not about just taking care of ourselves and having an ego. It's taking care of ourselves 
but not at the expense of others because we know what we want to do. We know where we want to go. We want to learn to be able to say no, to be able to tell others how we think and feel. And why is that sometimes difficult? Well, if we look back at the uh, playground, right? A lot of times when we were younger, we were told to do more collective things, things where not necessarily competing or um, you know, winners and losers or um, invading sports like football or soccer. A lot of times we're playing hopscotch, we're playing jump rope, all fun things, nothing wrong with it. But a lot of times those are the activities promoted for young girls to play where there's no winner or loser, everybody's cooperating together, which is okay, but it's certainly not promoting us to be able to deal so much with conflict management we're struggling in those areas. We struggle to have those moments to be able to, because as young girls, we're told to get along and everyone plays and everyone plays in a very equal and equitable way. But the boys can play it a different way. So think about that a little bit on the recess side. And then think about those first jobs that primarily girls are getting, babysitters, right? Primarily, I, that was one of my first jobs was babysitting. I hated it, so I did it, I was a referee, all right? But babysitting was one of those things that primarily is a role of a young girl and what is the role of a babysitter? To put everybody in front of them, to make sure everybody's needs are met, their food is taken care of, the activities they want. It's about taking care of everybody else. Not wrong or right. It's just simply something that is a ha habit, something that we systematically have in this um, culture. So women are more ingrained to put everyone else in front. Their needs come first. And then as we grow and we get into these places where we've seen women not be as active in conversations or um, typically give other people the spotlight or come into these things like conflict management that we haven't had as much practice in. And now we wanna express our ideas and our thoughts and opinions. And a lot of times I've had my own and a lot of times when you're gonna to talk to people and women, particularly in your own environments, when we get expressive, we are emotional. Um, we can't regulate our thoughts versus our opinions. We can't, we're not putting data to things. We're, we're, we are all these things and labels that then oftentimes can make us shut down, make us feel like we're not heard, make us feel like we're labeled in a way that's unfair. And a lot of times that label comes with a big B, especially when we start saying no. That big B word, we say no, we tell others how we feel, we stand firm in our decisions. And we get these negative connotations. And so why is a healthy self-interest something that we all need to develop, men, women, that it's about taking of our, our care of ourselves, but not at the expense of others, that we want to have ideals and priorities in our own life that we want to achieve. And so how do we do that? So if we think about what fearless and capable is available to do, but why might women in your organization maybe teeter on whether they want to join? or maybe uncertain that this is something that, you know, will benefit them in the long run. Well, because everything's been told to them, it's gonna be about the whole group coming together and that everybody should be taken care of before themselves. And that if they come to you and say, hey, I would like to do something that's female specific, you might tell them, oh, that's like, they were, it's too emotional. That's something that's just, a, it's not what we need for soccer. Well, no, because what we're working to do is build a fearless mindset, a belief in the capabilities to achieve which promotes and gets everyone in a mindset to be able to get priorities in line, get their ideals written out, their vision for what they want to do, and start moving towards it, which makes your organization better. But now we add in rel relatability, that reliable, consistent, relatable mentorship from other women working in the industry. And that's where these things start to really come in, because now we have role modeling. We have examples of success. We have people to talk to that have been through similar lived experiences who can likely relate to the feelings that we felt being in a room of all men or could relate to being on the field um, when you're passed by and not assumed as someone as the lead um, coach or the head um, or the lead uh, referee and, and, and head of coach and so on. So those experiences are, are real and they happen frequently and a lot of women struggle to relate. And so when um, we can find ways to make this uh, a program that's accessible, not just on certain times of the year or for certain moments, it's there 24 seven. My belief is that this starts to help us retain more. 
we start to get coaches and referees and administrators into our programs. And when they get those moments of struggle, they can find it. They can find support and they can find that relatability that gives them that sense of going, okay, I'm not alone and I can work through this and I can find success. So we do it in three main ways. We have a membership platform. Okay, that's available through your, your desktop, that's available on a mobile app. It gives them online courses that they can do on their own in their self paced time. They can have tools to communicate with different members in the program that are relatable based off of geography, title, uh, maybe even sport, because we have other sports that have come into the program as well. Um, but all of it is also geared towards not only having a personal sense of what you want to do, but a professional sense, because everyone is working in the sports industry. And so this membership platform is 24-7 available to them with all of these other workshop events and tools and things that are happening that are there when they need them. I met with a young woman last week, and she's pretty young, pretty new. Um, just got a director role in a club and she started to describe, which is basically imposter syndrome. And if you're not uh, familiar with imposter syndrome, essentially it's the phenomenon that uh, you might be discovered because you don't belong there. Uh, and so we went through this and sure enough, she's joining as a member and I was able to show her this one hour presentation that was very well done and all these resources to understand this phenomenon. And she was like, I'm not the only one. I'm like, no, no, you're not. We daily face that. I, I faced it, you know, last night and the two days before on how do I understand and comprehend whether I am good enough to be there. And so we go back to the data and facts. So it really is a good tool, especially when we can help as mentors to give them those resources and be able to have them kind of self-guide and discover these answers. The other way we do this is small group and peer mentorship. And so we have monthly workshop events that are hosted by a mentor in our program. Uh, they are women that are in, again, multiple different roles in the sports industry that present on a mindset, skill set, or both that is really applicable to the, to the women that are members in our program. And so uh, Coming up actually next week, we're going to talk about establishing value statements and those value statements obviously come out of a strong belief of your core values, but then how do those value statements really turn into principles and guiding um, lights to how we're going to make decisions and make priorities in our life. Uh, we're looking for someone that is going to be coming in in uh, the later part of April to talk a little bit more about those moments that um, we start to discover ourselves being successful <laughs> and how we rationalize when the individual in us is getting this attention. And sometimes we tend to deflect and tell how people are doing a great job instead of learning to take that success as something we did. We often give credit to others, which isn't bad, but it also then minimizes our contributions. And we want women to be able to go, no, this is what I did. Why? It makes your organization look good. It helps them with the next job. It helps them write the next resume. It helps them work into the next job interview and be able to talk about themselves and be confident in the skills they brought, all right? So those types of things are available to them live as well as team huddles, which are these informal, not recorded, really intimate settings where women can come in and we have topics that we're covering, but it's really just a discussion with other women in the network, in the community that they can ask questions about, they can listen in, they can get guidance. And again, it's not recorded, it's not going anywhere public. It's just a safe space that they can count on three times a month to be able to come in and have these discussions and this relatability at their fingertips. Uh, we do other things like book clubs and fun things like that, that give those opportunities as well on more of a, you know, as, as interested basis, not necessarily um, as more of a structure to what you're, you're getting as a member. But these are really good opportunities for women to be able to find and network with others. Um, and so we do that because it's one in, in important for our mentors as well to be impactful and see that impact that they can make. But it's also important for our members to see themselves coming into the role as mentors. And I'll kind of get into that because we definitely want them to see their position right now as something that is learning and growing, apprenticing, but that they have a responsibility down the road to help the next set of women um, come into these jobs and be really successful as well. The final way that Fearless and Capable is trying to work is in the one-on-one -on -one space. And this is really the bread and butter of how this program works. Um, we are pairing mentors and men mentees up um, that are done through more than just a same level or same title. 
We are looking at learning styles. We are looking at desired outcomes and skill sets, experiences with mentorship, um, all of these areas to really create this profile of a member and a mentee that was looking for that real deep in um, deep growth mindset experience. And we're going to do the same. And we do the same with our mentors and creating their own profiles so that when we actually go to match up mentee and member, our mentee, excuse me, and mentor, um, I'm not just going, you know, here's a line and that's a, uh, a match. It's really going a lot deeper so that the mentee is going to come out feeling like she is in this mentoring relationship for a reason that she's going to maximize what she can get out of this experience. And how we do that is we create a mentoring relationship. So it's not just a walk in, tell me what's been going on for the last four weeks. Uh, we actually create this agreement that is shared between the mentee, the mentor and myself so that we have a path, we have accountability. We know where we're working towards when we're in these relationships together. And we're looking at what are action steps that can be done to get us to a desired outcome. So it's not just a check-in, it's really a growth Bind it program that is really working on what resources are needed to help get you there, who are the people that you need to know and want to know to get to where you want to be at the end of the day, and then how are you going to be supported in those efforts? And a mentor is a great person who sits between your reflections and your decisions. You've got to tell us what's going on and you've got to make that next decision, but we can sit there and plug in thoughts and challenges and ideas and resources resources and people. And so that that accountability that comes out of the agreement really makes this process a lot different than other mentorship programs that are out there, because there's a lot of accountability to having growth in the program. And so we do surveys and other things mid midway and at the end to try to kind of keep tabs on whether this is going forward. Um, but the one on one sessions are not just a check in at a local coffee shop. This is really digging deep, but our mentors are spending time preparing and helping them uh, through these processes between meetings and check-ins and, and so on. So really those, those three ways of having the 24 seven access through a platform, having the ability to come into small group and workshop events to meet live with mentors and other people, and then having that opportunity to be paired up one-on-one -on -one with a mentor is really how we're working to bring the fearless and capable missions to life of that reliability, that consistency, and then that relatability at the end of the day. Our mentors are a growing list of women, um, approximately get into like 45, I think one just signed on yesterday, so we might be at 46, if I've got the number right in my head, um, but a growing number of women that are committed to that role as mentors. Um, they're in different roles within the industry, coaches, uh, DOCs, college coaches, pro, referees, uh, administrators, uh, sports tech, um, just the wide gamut, owners of uh, pro teams and semi-pro teams, psychologists, social workers, and so on. The list goes on because you know what? They're working in sport and they've probably worn hats that many of our members are going to be able to come in and have some relatability, whether it's in a prof uh, profession or career they're in right now, or perhaps one they're interested in going into. Um, so it's a really amazing set of women that are committed to kind of answering that Marco Polo call. Um, so we're yelling Marco that they need help and the, um, you know, mentors are there answering with the polo call of saying, we're going to be there to support you at the end of the day. And so these mentors are not just women that, you know, get the gold star and going, great, you're going to be wonderful. They also have their own training that they have to go to. They're on onboarding um, through Fearless and Capable to make sure they're aligned and going to be um, a great resource for their pairings when they do get matched up. So an amazing group of women continuing to um, add on. And you can see those mentors that we currently have at fearlessandcapable.com. And I'll kind of give you those resources at the end of this presentation. So at the end of you know, the Fearless and Capable experiences, we typically are asking, you know, what encouragement do you now have as going through a one-on-one -on -one session or at the end of our team huddles and workshop events, what have you learned today that's encouraging you to go forward? And part of that is because we want them to promote this healthy self-interest. They want to be able to grow, take this information and go forward. But our encouragement as a group in terms of why programs like this exist, not just to check a box in um, your DEI initiatives, but to really give that thought of how are we going to move this game forward in a more inclusive way, is that we want to find unique and creative ways to give these equitable development opportunities. 
I'm a coaching instructor who does a lot of co-ed courses. I also am a big proponent of female courses. So I'm currently running an all-female D license in Kansas City. I've run a couple others through Chicago and Iowa. Um, but these are things that, you know, from opportunities like all-female courses or opportunities to be a part of Fearless and Capable or a female workshop, that ability for us to recognize that as leaders, we may be amazing mentors, um, and you probably are. You're probably doing a great job helping them out. But that relatability piece as a woman is probably something that might be missed. And so if you can help them find these different development opportunities, these different creative ways and be equitable. And when you're looking at your budget on how you're going to support maybe your staff or the opportunities you're going to give them to be a part of things, considering programs like Fearless and Capable are important. It's our encouragement together to know we can make the game better. The other thing I always encourage in these presentations is the understanding of our conscious and unconscious bias and that call in behavior that if we can be a little bit more comfortable with bringing groups together and talking about things that we may realize don't or things that may come into women not applying for your position that's open or women that don't stay on very long on a board or on your staff. Well, yeah, there's real reason like a move or a new relationship or something else that comes into their life, a change of career just because they want. But sometimes there are actual things going on like obstacles and challenges that actually probably be playing into that decision for them to stay or join your organization. And so when in Cal, you can be able to bring in participants, bring in staff members, bring in people that are surrounding your organization and group and have an open, respectful dialogue about where conscious and unconscious bias is playing a part into how the organization is running and how they may be recruiting future members, you really get into this, this information and this data to start figuring out where are low hanging fruit where is the low hanging fruit, excuse me, to be able to really capitalize on opportunities to gain more females. So I'll give you an example on that. Um, I, I had a club that was talking about, you know, struggling to get female coaches on their competitive side. And so a few of the things we discussed was, well, you know, then they have kids and they leave. And so we talked a little bit about their practices and well, what were, um, best practices, not training practices. What and how did you approach um, the conversation when they, you know, disclosed to you that they were pregnant or expecting, or maybe they were adopting? Um, how did you manage the conversation and the expectations upon their return? Um, how were the expectations of understanding, you know, if they can be a mom and coach, who were you giving these opportunities for? And come to find out, uh, they just kind of said, congrats. And they didn't really acknowledge maybe some of those fears and understanding or lack of understanding to what she would be able to do, you know, during her pregnancy or past um, when the baby was here, what, what options she would have. You know, I know women who have been permitted to miss part of the season or a whole fall season and rejoin their team in the spring because the club is excited about this, uh, you know, obviously new bundle of joy for this coaching mother, but also wants to make sure that the mother feels like she doesn't have to come back for her team in the fall if by the necessities of the baby, it makes sense for her to come back later in the season. But they just avoided the conversation, completely avoided it. And therefore probably made the woman feel like they were just not having expectations or not having um, you know, those, those realistic thoughts about what this means for a coaching mother. And so it's no fault of one or the other party, but it's the fact that your club or your organization should have these things in place. Um, and so that a woman that discloses she's expecting or planning on bringing in a family member um, by adoption or, or fostering, you're there ready to go, okay, great. Here's how our organization, you know, these are our policies, our procedures. This is how we handle it. Um, how are you feeling about things? Where are you having hesitations as maybe a coach coming into um, being a mom in the first season? All of these things have to happen, but there was just this lack of conversation that are low hanging fruit, which means go talk to other clubs, go talk to other groups and organizations that already have these kind of maternity, paternity, by the way, I'm a big advocate of paternity, um, maternity and paternity leave policies in place, go find them, they exist. And if you can't find them, reach out to me, reach out to others. We know groups that are doing that, they can give you resources and ways to, you know, incorporate that into your own uh, groups running and operations. So it's a very 
got a general example for women, but it's a it's an often one that those are saying you have a baby and you leave the career um, because it's tough. Well, it is tough, but it's also doable. Um, I'm doing it, and I know loads and loads of women that are and can be great resources in that space and time. Um, so it's a big piece. How are we going to have conscious and unconscious bias come to the table? And then when we have these things that we're called out on that potentially we don't realize those unconscious um, you know obstacles that we may be creating. How do we find people that can come in and give us resources and tools and give us that insight to really solidify that this is something we want to do? Because together, again, we can then provide relatable mentorship. Again, it doesn't have to be one mentor for one person. They can have multiple mentors that makes their experience um, and their ideals more possible and more realistic based off the people they surround um, themselves with. And so really our encouragement together is that we collectively promote women to have these healthy self-interest, to promote their advocacy of their opportunities, their challenges, and then therefore we all come together to give them that relatability that they're really seeking in order to meet those next goals. Because at the end of the day, if we do all this stuff, we start to build our bench, all right? We build that bench of women and men and people of color, everybody, having a more inclusive ability to come in and be a contributing factor to your organization, to your group, to your team. But remember, nobody wants to sit on the bench forever, right? <laughs> they want the chances to go in and experience things and then come off and be able to have guidance and feedback. Go back to those first three questions I asked you. Who are the people there at their beginning when they may be riding the bench a little bit more, who's giving that guidance, that feedback, and there for them when they're struggling or not sure what to do next? All right, that's where roles of mentors are super important to helping us retain and particularly women when they're seeing themselves on the bench sometimes longer, sometimes ignored. We've got to be better about recognizing, putting them in, giving them experience. And then when we do pull them off, giving them the confidence that they're going to come back in and they have that ability to get into the game metaphorically. The other thing that I want to make sure is that if fearlessly capable of something you want to be a part of or your group wants to be a part of, um, that you're not just doing this for a public perception, that you're doing this to be able to help set this new status quo that women should be in the workplace when it relates to sports, that they should be able to have coaching opportunities that are equitable, that we should be able to see education opportunities for women as something that we want to make sure happens in our budget line and we want to make sure our opportunities that they find to be beneficial to who they are, their, those identities that they relate to. Um, and so be a part of that new status quo. And we talk a lot about, um, in, in some ways, uh, Louisville Racing, the, the Lou Racing uh, NWSL team, being one of those first soccer teams to come out in the pro leagues to talk about you know embryo freezing and giving these uh, professional athletes the opportunity to not think about necessarily having to have the baby now, that they have these options, just options. We'll come to find out the NW, or, um, WNBA was doing that before. And so how do we get this to be something that maybe it's not at the youth industry yet, but it certainly becomes these things that are status quo that groups have, all right, that they are a part of mentorship on a regular basis, that they're giving relatable, that they're giving those opportunities to others. And that the representation on your staff, on your board is not just a, well, we have a woman. Look, we have one, she's there the token, that, that doesn't go very far. Um, that doesn't make women want to work for you by saying we have one woman. Look, we have her. Yep, she's there. Doesn't, it doesn't do it. Um, and realizing that representation also is something that helps promote more diverse players coming into your organization. And so if we're doing this all for the good of the game, to raise the level of soccer, to have more players participate, when we can see uh, different individuals working in the game that a young person can see themselves in, they then see themselves in that career. It gives them that if I can see them, I can be them mentality, which is super, super important. And there's all these amazing videos on social media. Uh, I saw more one more recently with the movie Encanto. And if you haven't seen it, um, you know, that we don't talk about Bruno song is one that is more more excessively annoying sometimes than the Frozen song. But at the end of the day, seeing these cute videos of kids seeing themselves in the movies is really important. And go back to the picture at the beginning. I never had to question if I could coach. 
because I had a woman having kids in front of me. Now, where did I have the question? Okay, how do I actually be a mom to do this? Now that I'm becoming a mom or I want to be a mom, where are the other females in the industry that are working as a mother who feel those same lived experiences? So having that representation is something that not just translates among your staff by bringing diverse lived experiences to the table to improve your group. It also gives those participants that ability to see themselves as potentially lifelong soccer influencers, coaches, referees, administrators, and beyond. The other benefit a program like Fearless Listing Capable will have if you choose to partner, invest, come in and be an individual in the program, maybe mentor in the program, however, is that we're going to have this development, development of mentors and leaders, because like I said, I ultimately want these members and mentees to see themselves as a mentor down the road, to see that benefit of what they got from the people that gave time and energy to them to want to go back and do that for the next generation of coaches, of referees and administrators. I can tell you by not having very many female mentors, that word of being a mentor really wasn't something that clicked until a couple of years ago. Until someone was like, oh, you know, mentoring. And I was like, well, yeah, if I look back, it, they've been guys up to a few years ago. And so I do, I do have that responsibility. You're right, I should be giving back. It's something I'm passionate about. It's something I wanna do. And that's what's kind of molded into Fearless and Capable is because there's this development of understanding that as leaders and mentors, you really can have an impact on what this game looks like for so many. And I leave you with this. There are so many out there that today will choose to quit as a player, as a coach, as a referee, as an administrator, as on your board. Because they look around and they kind of feel hopeless. And especially as a woman, that is, it's hopeless that I keep giving ideas or thoughts and I don't get heard. I keep giving an idea and someone else takes the idea. Or I just don't feel like it's worth giving um, a chance there because I never get that assignment, whether it's a referee game or a, a team in the club. It happens. It happens every day. And we get those phone calls. And so we can help together our benefit of working in programs like Fearless and Capable, putting staff in there, um, promoting it, bringing mentors that are in your group to be a part of Mentors and Fearless and Capable to help share their influence and impact. We're all going to see this great development of people in the game that really desire um, a great experience that's inclusive to everyone and anyone, um, whether the color of the skin, the gender that they identify, and hopefully making this at the end of the day, a game that we all want to participate in for a very long time. So. On that note, um, my name and email address, everything is there in front of you. Um, so Candace at fearlessandcapable.com. There is my phone number, our website, fearlessandcapable.com. Um, having us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Fearless and Capable. And then on Instagram, we just had to add the underscore. Um, so fearless underscore capable. You can certainly find us there. Um, and I'm happy at any point in time to have a conversation with any of you about your organization or your own role. If you have an individual interest as well, um, we can certainly get into the system. You can see the membership opportunities and programming there. I can show you the one-on-one -on -one, um, pro or one-on-one -on -one mentoring agreement. So you kind of get an idea of where that process can go. Um, but certainly want to know more about what's going on with you and how we at Fearless and Capable can help because we, again, is all of these amazing women working across the country in multiple ways, contributing to the next generation of amazing coaches and referees and administrators and the youth game and beyond. So uh, Carrie and Kathy, thank you very much for the opportunity. And at this point, I'd love to answer, uh, open up for questions. If anybody has, feel free to mute or put them in the chat. Thank you, Candice. While if, if there are people thinking of questions they want to ask, I just want to let everybody know that um, we have a discount code that is specific to NCYSA that we will share out um, with all of you who attended today or all of you who are, will receive the recording, um, and then that we will obviously promote through our um, email and social media and, and various activities that we do um, that is a 20% discount to an individual membership with Fearless and Capable, um, and then also a discount for um, if you were interested in, in any of the mentoring packages. Um, so we will share that information out with everybody as well. And if you as a club are, you know, maybe you have multiple members um, or coaches that are female or referee groups or, or whatever it might be, 
um, there are opportunities at you know a lower club level member level um, to be able to partner and support your you know your own folks so certainly if that's something that you know in your organization is of interest reach out and we can absolutely discuss that as well yeah so i have a question yeah um my name is michelle reynolds i guess you can see that on the screen um <laughs> So I first became a, a referee in 2003, and okay. um, I, and a couple of years after that, I became a referee assigner. So yep. you know, I have been employing teenagers because that's the vast majority of my referee pool. I got kids yep. working for me that weren't even born um, when I first started doing this, right? <laughs> and yeah. um, it, it has been very difficult to keep a female official, even though I'm a female assigner, and I think I'm one of the few in the state of North Carolina, um, and even though I became an instructor, and honestly, it was August of 2019 when I certified 33 brand new referees, almost half of them were female. It was the first time I had, you know, a big group of young women working for me, and um, unfortunately, the pandemic hit, so we lost several of those, because just statewide, we lost a lot of reps because of the pandemic, so I'm trying right. to rebuild, but I still have more young women right. working for me than ever before. Some I've gotten back out on the field. Sometimes we'll do an all-female crew, um, awesome. but because I grew up as a tomboy, as one of the boys playing with the boys, I actually do better in male-dominated professions than I do female-dominated mm -hmm. professions, and I have really struggled to know how to relate to the, some of these young women and help them to be more assertive because being assertive is just how I survived my childhood, right? Yep. So that shutdown thing that you were talking about, like I'm just trying not to lose my temper and verbally eviscerate someone because that's my first impulse, right? Right. Because I just don't give a damn what people think. And that makes right. me a, a good referee sometimes and other times not so much. Um, right. I'm sure my reputation precedes itself, but I'm guessing this... Uh, if, if by becoming a part of this, you guys can coach me and train me and help me understand how to better work with these young women because I, I have stayed with this in part because our school systems are failing, not that necessarily they ever did, to create good citizens and, and skills that actually work in the workplace mm -hmm. and in the adult world, right? right? We have these overprotective helicopter parents that did not exist when I was coming <laughs> along um, you know, and I feel like officiating is a great place for them to learn really valuable life and work skills, men and women. And so I, I'm a part of that because I want to help that younger generation, like you were talking about, right? The, the right. support. Um, so I'm assuming this would be a good way for me to learn how to be better at that, right? Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, when we look at the mentors that are available, you know, I'm not just finding people that I think would be great in my style. So I kind of alluded to there's this stylistic component that I'm going to look for. Um, and we're all naturally inclined in some way or the other. And, you know, Michelle, we probably have some relatability in the fact that I've been the only female or one of two female in every course I've ever taken um, on the soccer side. And that never stopped me. Um, I always felt pretty darn comfortable in the situation. Um, and so understanding kind of, you know, that different type of mentality, it's not right or wrong. It's just different. Um, it took me time as well. And so talking to other people and learning about how, you know, I, I forget the number, excuse me, and I, I'm trying to remember it, but I feel like on average in this study, um, introverts typically are going to take about 16 seconds to respond. Okay, so an introverted person, especially in a large group where they feel uncertain about their voice and that, they may take up to about 16 seconds to be comfortable to present an answer. And so for me, when I heard these kind of different ways that people learn and communicate and talk um, from mentors in, in my world that were, you know, psychologists and teachers and stuff, I was like, okay, so me who will just put out an answer, when I'm trying to help, I might need to realize that. I should be giving a little bit more time. And what I think is time is really not that much time. Um, and so when we are, you know, bringing in all these mentors and stylistically thinking about strengths in different areas, not only is the area of expertise valued, but also the way that they teach and so that they can give us insights and tools that work for them with different, you know, 
learning styles and needs that they're working in their own spaces as, as you know, like you're saying, instructors or assigners or people just trying to help the next generation. So I think that um, I'm kind of smirking because I might have one or two that are kind of popping in my head as kind of just a very initial, like, ooh, these would be good people for you to talk with. Um, because that is, I think that's a really um, one insightful thing for you to say and very authentic to who you are and where you know your strengths and your weaknesses are, are, are a huge piece to this. Um, and so role modeling that first and foremost, Michelle, is a huge piece for all of those young women that are coming up as officials and seeing a woman go, I am great and awesome at this. And this is something I want to get better at. We've got to have that piece in, in part as well. And so I think those are those are just all these different areas that you can come into the program, be meeting with someone on a regular basis in between, let's say, you know, courses or meetings that you're having with your own. Um, mentees in a way or your own programs that you're running and then this mentor is kind of guiding you okay what about this skill set or this tool or this resource how did that work out for you is that something you saw as a benefit um, or something you want to work on so absolutely absolutely in that capacity we're there for you right thank you yeah any other questions I know it's a lot in lunchtime, so people might be <laughs> chewing and listening as well, so. I don't see anything in the chat um, okay. right now, but like Candace said, her, her contact information is on the screen. And um, if you didn't get a chance to write it down and you have questions for her after, you can always reach out to um, Wendy or Kathy or I at NCUSA and we can help put you in touch with her. Um, but Candace, just thank you again for um, talking to our membership and for all that you're doing for females and, and you know, in, in our sport and like people like Michelle, I think uh, we really appreciate the empowerment and the relatability. Um, so thank you for doing this. We look forward to working with Fearless and Capable more um, over the next couple of months and year um, and uh, bringing different activities and such to um, NCUSA's membership through our various programs that we offer. So again, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for signing on. We hope you all have a wonderful day. If we can do anything for you as always, please just reach out. Thank you guys for the time. Have a great lunch. Yeah, thank you, Candace. Thanks, Candace. We enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Have Thanks, a good one, guys. ladies, for attending. That was awesome, Candace. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, quick question. Didn't you say there was some kind of discount code or something you were, um, that did that appear in the chat and I missed it? No, ma'am, I will send that out to you. Michelle, You, I assume you registered, correct, for the yes. course? Okay, yep, I will I mean, send this... that out to you. Yep, Okay. absolutely. Right. You guys will get an email later today, anybody who signed up with that code. So be on, and look for your email for it. All right, fantastic. Yep, I'm pretty sure this is my next step. So thank you very much. Awesome. It's... Thanks, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. All right. Thank All you, right. Candace. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Talk to and you as you see you later, Wendy. Yep. Bye, guys. Bye.